Okay, hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Today we'd like to talk about the safety and contraindications for thrombolysis. So as you've heard from the other lectures, so first of all, we're excluding a bleed and confirming the diagnosis, both clinically and from imaging, like CT or MRI, then deciding the severity of stroke and then determining any contraindications. And of course, later on, we give the treatment of thrombolysis. All right, so why IV thrombolysis? So IV thrombolysis treatment increases the chance of favorable outcome at 90 days. So regardless of the, the index uh, or the score that you look at, so whether it's NIH score, Bartel index, modified Rankin, et cetera, you see a favorable outcome at 90 days. And you can see it's significant. This is what we tell the patient. So this is out of 100 patients treated, we tell them about 32 will be will benefit and uh, about, just about three might be harmed. So the safety profile of activities. So they looked at from PCAS3 trial, the mortality by time interval. So they saw there's no increase in risk of 90 day mortality in patients treated with PPA within three hours of symptom onset compared to placebo. You can see in this section here, 0.9 versus 3.2. Although there is a risk of, uh, there is a significant increase in the rate of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage for patients treated up to four and a half hours after symptom onset with TPA compared to placebo, the overall risk of ICH is low and mortality rate is low and similar to both patients. In both patients. So you can see 90 days of mortality, 3.8 versus 4.5, so it's less than the placebo. The evidence for benefit for TPA was that they, regardless of the treatment delay, age, or baseline NIH score. If you look at the treatment delay, you can see less than three hours. It's a good outcome, three to four and a half. Again, on more than four and a half, it crosses the midline, but still towards a more favorable outcome. You can see it's interesting, regardless of the age. So less than 80, more than 80, still it's towards the more benefit. And also regardless of the baseline NIH test score, so regardless of the score, the stroke was mild, moderate, or severe, you can see universally it was better outcome. The TPA uh, effect is our time dependent. You can see the numbers needed to treat. If you treat them the earlier the possible, the, the earlier the better, of course, you can see between zero to one and a half hours, the numbers needed to treat were 4.5 if it was, Treated between one and a half to three hours, the numbers you treat doubles, or goes up to nine. And beyond that, three to four and a half, the numbers needed to treat is about 14. This is the same representation again. The earlier we treat, the greater the benefit for the patients. You can see less than 90 minutes, number needed to treat, four to five. 90 minutes to three hours, the number needed to treat is nine. And again, between three and four and a half hours, the number needed to treat goes up to 14. All right, so this is the just to, a representation of the SIDAN uh, score. So it can predict the hemorrhage because it's always a, a concern. So it's SIDAN stands for, stands for sugar, early infarct, dense or hyperdense MCA, age, and NRSA score. So the higher their blood glucose, they're given a score. The early infarct sign on admission CT scan, whether it's present or not. Dense or hyperdense cerebral artery on admission CT. Again, yes or no. Age, less than 75, more than 75. And access score uh, on admission, given points. So if they have the, high, the higher the score, the more likely the bleed. So what else determines the benefit? The clot location. Okay, so this is very important. The more proximal, it is well known, the more proximal the occlusion is, the less likely it will respond to IV thrombolysis and they need mechanical thrombectomy. This is true for ICA, say around 4.4%. Same for basilar artery. And the more distal you go, you see it goes up to 30 or even 40%. And another uh, systematic uh, review and meta-analysis published in Stroke 2016 by Pierre et al. They looked at partial or complete uh, recanalization. You can see in the basilar around 13%, same for the ICA. Then it, go, it went up to an M1, about 35%. For M2, M3, goes up to 52%, interesting. For complete recanalization, similar to the other study, around 4% for ICA and basal artery. 
for M1 occlusion, about 21%. And beyond that, M2, M3 is 38%. Another factor is the clot length uh, that determines the response to IV thrombolysis. You can see the longer the clot is, the less likelihood that it would recanalize. And usually from studies, it's, if it's more than eight millimeters, it is less likely to respond to treatment. Another factor is the clot composition. So the clot or the thrombus composition also affects the response to IV thrombolysis. So in one study, they looked at thrombus composition and the efficacy of thrombolysis and thrombectomy in acute ischemic stroke. This was by... Riquius et al. was published in Stroke 2021. So the clot is either fibrin rich or RBC rich. So which component is more predominant? The fibrin rich uh, clot was more resistant to thrombolysis because it was less permeable. There was less penetration for TPA because they had, had smaller pores versus the RBC uh, rich clot. It was also more difficult to retrieve. Uh, by, by mechanical thrombectomy, the fibrin-rich clot, because it was more dense and compact compared to the RBC-rich, which was easier to retrieve, but it fragmented more easily. So now we've come to the main talk with the contraindications. This is a very nice uh, mnemonic. It says no TPA. So N for neoplasm, so uh, the brain. The heart for endocarditis, either suspected or known. Then the T, three months, three weeks. So within three months, no head trauma, neurosurgery, or ischemic stroke. Within three weeks, GI bleed, GI malignancy. P for low platelets, less than 100. A for active bleeding, so arachnoid hemorrhage, ischemic, sorry, ICH, aortic dissection. A for AVMs, aneurysms, and anticoagulation. Now I'll just mention with some details the the 2019 updates to the guidelines, American Heart Association, American Stroke Guideline for early management of patients with acute ischemic stroke. So they divided it into green, uh, yellow, orange, and red. So strong recommendation, uh, less stronger recommendation, and later on harmful are not recommended. So in the green zone, so within three hours, IV alteplase 0.9 milligrams per kg, maximum dose of 90 milligrams over 60 minutes with initial 10% dose was given as a bolus over one minute is recommended for selected patients who may be treated within three hours of ischemic stroke symptoms. Then within three hours with regards to age, for otherwise medically eligible patients more than 18 years of age, it is recommended within three hours. Within three hours with regards to severe stroke, for severe strokes, IV alteplase indicated within three hours from stroke onset. So within three hours with mild disabling stroke for otherwise eligible patients with mild but disabling stroke, IV alteplase is recommended for patients who can be treated within three hours. For three to four and a half hours, IV alteplase is also recommended for selected patients who can be treated within three and four and a half hours of ischemic stroke symptom onset or patients last known well. For three to four and a half hours with regards to age, IV alteplase treated in the three to four and a half time window is recommended for those patients less than 80 years of age without a history of both diabetes mellitus or prior stroke, NIH score of less than 25, not taking any oral anticoagulants, and without imaging evidence of ischemic injury involving more than one third of the MCA territory. For urgency, treatment should be initiated as quickly as possible within the above listed timeframes because time of treatment is strongly associated with the outcome, as I mentioned before. For blood pressure, IV ultimately is recommended in patients with blood pressure less than 185 by 110. Okay. For blood glucose, IV ultimately is recommended in otherwise eligible patients with initial glucose level of more than 50 milligrams per deciliter. For the CT scan, IV ultimately administration is recommended in the setting of early ischemic changes on the non-contrast CT would of mild to moderate extent with otherwise uh, other than frank hypodensity. Prior antiplatelets, so IV antiplatelets in, in spite of patient being on antiplatelets, monotherapy, or even in combination, or even a patient taking combination, say for example, aspirin and clopidogrel, 
So the benefit of antiplase overweighs the possible increased risk of bleed. What about patients in end-stage renal disease? So for those, IV antiplase is also recommended. However, there is, if there is if those with elevated APTT may have elevated risk of hemorrhagic complications. Then for the in the yellow or orange, so this is maybe a much uh, less stronger recommendation. So between three to four and a half uh, hours, now with regards to age for patients more than eight years of age presenting with within the presenting with three to four and a half hour window, IV alteplase is safe and can be as effective as in younger patients. In the same period, three to four and a half with diabetes mellitus and prior stroke. So with prior stroke and presenting within three to four and a half hour window, IV alteplase may be as effective as, treat, as treatment in the three, zero to three hour window and may be a reasonable option. The three and four and a half hours with severe stroke. So the benefit of IV alteplase between three to four and a half hours from symptom onset for patients with very severe stroke symptom that is in IR score more than 25 is uncertain. Three to four and a half hours mild disabling stroke for those for those eligible patients with mild disabling stroke. IV alteplase may be reasonable for patients who can be treated within three to four and a half hours. What about wake up and unknown time of onset? So it may be administered within four and a half hours of stroke symptom recognition uh, may be beneficial, or in those with awake with stroke symptoms or have unclear time onset of more than four and a half hours from last known well uh, or at a baseline state who have DWI on the MRI lesion smaller than one third of the MCA and have no visible signal change on the flare, so they have mismatch. What about pre-existing stroke? So it does not seem to be independently increase the risk of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage after IVT alteplase, but it may be associated with less neurological improvement and higher mortality. So it may be, so IV alteplase for acute stroke with pre-existing disability, MRS more than two, may be reasonable. But of course, each patient is uh, evaluated independently. Early improvement. So IVL to place treatment is reasonable for patients who present with moderate to severe ischemic stroke who, and demonstrate early improvement but remain moderately impaired and potentially disabled by the judgment of the examiner. What about seizures? So seizures at the onset. So IVL is reasonable in, the patient, in a patient with seizure at the time of onset of acute stroke if evidence suggests that residual impairment are secondary to stroke and not a post-ectal phenomenon. With regards to blood glucose, treatment with IV alteplase in patients with acute ischemic stroke who present with initial glucose level of less than 50 or more than 400 that are subsequently normalized and who are otherwise eligible may be reasonable. Coagul with regards to coagulopathy, IV alteplase may be reasonable in patients who have a history of warfarin use, an INR of less than 1.7 or a PT of less than 15 seconds. What about dural puncture? So IV alteplase may be considered for patients who present with acute ischemic stroke, even instances when they may have undergone a lumbar puncture in the last seven days. Arterial puncture, the safety efficacy of administering IV alteplase in, in acute stroke patients who have had an arterial puncture for non-compressible blood vessel in the past, uh, in the preceding seven days are still uncertain. Recent major trauma and acute ischemic stroke with recent major trauma that's within 14 days, not involving the head, IVF phase may be carefully considered with the risks of bleeding from injuries related to the trauma weighed against the severity and potential disability from the ischemic stroke. What about recent major surgery? So the use of IV alteplase in carefully selected patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke who have undergone a major surgery in the preceding 14 days may be considered, but again, the potential increased risk of surgical site hemorrhage would be weighed against the anticipated benefits of reduced stroke-related neurologic deficits. What about GI and genitourinary bleeding? So in the reported literature, the details uh, a low bleeding risk with IV alteplase administration in the setting of post in the past uh, GI and genitourinary 
bleeding, administration of IV alkylase in these patient population may be reasonable. However, it's important to note that administration within 21 days of GI bleed event is not recommended and contraindicated. For menstruation, so IV alteplase probably indicated women who are menstruating who present with acute ischemic stroke and do not have history of menorrhagia. When history of recent or active vaginal bleeding causing clinically significant anemia, then emergency consultation with the gynecologist is probably indicated and a decision about IV alteplase is made. What about extracranial cervical dissection? IV alteplase and acute ischemic stroke known or suspected to be associated with extracranial cervical arterial dissection is reasonably safe within four and a half hours and probably recommended. For the intracranial arterial dissection, the IV alteplase usefulness and hemorrhagic risk known or suspected, uh, suspected to be associated with intracranial arterial dissection remain unknown and uncertain and not well established. For the unruptured intracranial aneurysms, for patients presented with acute ischemic stroke who are known to harbor a small or moderate size that is less than 10 millimeters, unruptured, unsecured intracranial aneurysm, administration of IV alteplase is reasonable and probably recommended. The usefulness and risk of IV alteplase in patients with acute ischemic stroke who harbor unruptured or unsecured intracranial aneurysm are not well established. The usefulness and risk of IV alteplase in patients with acute ischemic stroke who harbor a giant unruptured and unsecured intracranial aneurysm are not well established. For intracranial vascular malformations, for patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke who are known to harbor an unruptured and untreated intracranial vascular malformations, the usefulness and risk of admission of IV alteplase is not well established. Because of the increased risk of ICH in this population, IV alteplase may be considered in patients with stroke with severe neurological deficit and high likelihood of morbidity and mortality. For cerebral microbleeds and otherwise eligible patients who have previously had a small number, that is one to 10, of cerebral microbleeds demonstrated on MRI, administration of IV alteplase is reasonable. In otherwise eligible patients who have previously had a high burden of cerebral microbleed, that's more than 10, demonstrated on MRI, treatment with IV alteplase may be associated with increased risk of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage, and the benefit of treatment are uncertain. Treatment may be reasonable if there is potential of sustainable benefit. Concomitant use of Concomitant use of IV glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors with IV alteplase is not well established. For extra axial intracranioplasms, IV alteplase treatment is probably recommended for patients with acute ischemic stroke who harbor an extra axial intracranial neoplasm. What about MI? Another important topic is MI. So for acute MI, for patients presenting with concurrent stroke and acute MI treatment with alteplase, at the dose appropriate for cerebral ischemia followed by percutaneous coronary angioplasty and stenting is indicated. For recent MI, so a patient presenting with acute ischemic stroke and the history of recent MI in the past three months, treating ischemic stroke with IV alteplase is reasonable in the recent MI. If the recent MI was non STEMI, that's class of recommendation 2A, the same for if it's STEMI involving the right or inferior myocardium, but class of recommendation 2B, if it was again STEMI, still recommended for the STEMI involving the left anterior myocardium. For acute pericarditis, for patient with major acute ischemic stroke, uh, likely to produce severe disability and acute pericarditis, treatment with IV alteplase may be reasonable. For patient presenting with moderate acute ischemic stroke likely to produce mild disability and acute pericarditis treatment I will place is uncertain uh, net benefit. For those with left atrial or ventricular thrombus presenting with acute ischemic stroke likely to produce disability and no left atrial or ventricular thrombus, treatment IVL to place may be reasonable. 
for other cardiac diseases such as uh, myxoma or, or papillary fibroblastoma, it's also may, may be reasonable. For procedural stroke, so IVL to place is reasonable for treatment of acute ischemic stroke, complication of cardiac or cerebral angiographic procedures, depending on the usual eligibility criteria. What about malignancy? For systemic malignancy, the systemic, um, the say, sorry. For systemic malignancy, the safety and efficacy of IV alteplase in patients with current malignancy are not well established. What about pregnancy? IV alteplase administration may be considered in pregnancy when the anticipated benefits of of treating moderate or severe stroke outweigh the anticipated increased risk of uterine bleed. The safety and efficacy of IV alteplase in the early postpartum period, that is less than 14 days of, after delivery, are not, have not been well established. Ophthalmological conditions are also important. The use of IV alteplase in patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke who have a history of diabetic hemorrhagic retinopathy or other hemorrhagic ophthalmic condition is reasonable to recommend, but the potential increased risk of visual loss should be weighed against the anticipated benefits of reduced stroke-related deficits. For sickle cell disease, IV alteplase for those with acute ischemic stroke and sickle cell can be beneficial. It's important for our region. Hyperdense sign, IV alteplase can be beneficial. So it's not contraindicated as used to be thought before. For illicit drug use, it's again can be used. For stroke mimics, again, the risk of symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage in the stroke mimic population is quite low. So starting IVL to play is probably recommended in preference over delaying treatment to pursue additional diagnostic studies. Finally, we come to the contraindications, as you can see in the red zone. So between zero to three hours uh, window in mild to non-disabling non a stroke. So for otherwise eligible patients with mild non-disabling stroke, and I score zero to five, IV alteplase is not recommended for patients who could be treated within three hours of ischemic stroke symptom onset or patients last known well or at a baseline state. For three to four and a half hours window with mild non-disabling stroke, IV alteplase is not recommended for patients who could be treated within this time period. For with regards to CT, there remains insufficient evidence to identify a threshold of hypotenuation severity or extent that affects the treatment response to alteplase. However, administering IV alteplase in patients whose CT brain imaging exhibits extensive region or clear hypotenuation is not recommended. These patients have a poor prognosis despite IV alteplase and severe hypotenuation defines an obvious hypodensity uh, represents a reversible injury. So there's no point of treating them and could be harmful. Intracerebral hemorrhage, I would this should not be administered to patients who CT reveals acute intracerebral hemorrhage. For ischemic stroke within the past three months, so I would place in the patient presenting with a stroke who had a prior ischemic stroke within three months may be harmful. Severe head injury within three months, again, is contraindicated. For acute head trauma, Given the possibility of bleeding complication from underlying severe head trauma, IV alteplase administered in post-traumatic infarction that occurs during the acute in hospital phase. It should not be administered. For intracranial or intraspinal surgery within three months for patient acute ischemic stroke and a history of intracranial or spinal surgery within three months should, is potentially harmful. For history of intracranial hemorrhage, IV alteplase administration with those with ICH potentially uh, harmful. For subarachnoid hemorrhage, IV alteplase uh, presenting with symptoms and signs most concerned with subarachnoid hemorrhage may be harmful it's, and it's contraindicated. For GI malignancy or GI bleed within 21 days, so with the, within 21 days, their stroke event should not be considered high risk. For GI malignancy or GI bleed within 21 days, should be considered high risk and IV alteplase administration is potentially harmful. For coagulopathy, the safety of it and efficacy of IV alteplase in acute ischemic stroke with platelets of less than 100,000 and INR of more than 
an APTT of more than 40 seconds or PT more than 15 seconds are unknown and IV assays should not be administered. What about low molecular weight heparin? Again, should not be administered if they have received the full treatment dose of low molecular weight heparin within the previous 24 hours. If they have received thrombin inhibitors or factor 10 inhibitors, this is now a very important topic. Uh, so the use of IV alteplase in patients taking direct thrombin inhibitor or direct factor 10A inhibitors has not been firmly established, but may be harmful. So alteplase uh, could be considered in, if, when patients appropriately selected and appropriate laboratory tests such as APTT, INR, clotting time, thrombin time, or direct factor 10A activity assay are normal, or when the patient has not taken the dose of their anticoagulant for more than 48 hours and renal function is normal. Concomitant abkiximab should not be administered when concurrently with IV alteplase. Concomitant IV aspirin should not be given within 90 minutes after IV alteplase. For infective endocarditis, so patient with ischemic stroke and infective endocarditis, treatment with IV alteplase should not be administered because of the increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage. With regards to aortic arch dissection, IV alteplase, uh, potentially harmful and should not be administered. With regards to intraaxial, uh, intracranial neoplasm, the IV alteplase um, is potentially harmful should not be administered. Okay, thank you.